Welcome to Woodshop 101, a woodworking audio podcast geared toward the hobby weekend woodworker. Our hosts for the show are Jeremy Crawford and Drew Shore. Join these two different craftsmen for a lighthearted banter about everything in woodworking, online education, and how they produce content. Topics could include the latest news, tips, tricks, and designs to include furniture, crafts, and shop projects. Welcome to episode number five. Today, we will talk about hand tools and how we keep them sharp. We are joined by our guest host, David Picciuto of The Drunken Woodworker. How are you, David? I'm doing good. How are you guys doing? We're doing pretty good. Not bad. Not bad. So, that, That's what I like to hear. Yeah, well, it's better, better than horrible. <laughs> Not bad is definitely better than horrible. <laughs> Look, I could, have, I, could, I could be a lot worse than I am right now. So. Well, let's not. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. Let's uh, keep thinking positive thoughts and positive things will happen to you. There you go. All right. I want to remind you guys, uh, we, we have a new show sponsor. This show is going to be sponsored by WorkSharp. You can use the code WOODSHOP101, that's two words, for a discount during checkout at their website. So, again, that's WOODSHOP101. That's, put that in the discount uh, area or the coupon code of their website to get a discount for any product at their website. And I'd like to remind you, if you listen to the show on iTunes, to please give us a five-star rating. It'll ha- it will help us to reach a greater audience. Um, or if you watch it over on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe to us. Leave us a comment over there. Um, that way we can help grow this show and, and reach um, more people. So, David... Um, before we get started, you want to kind of introduce yourself for the people that probably already know you um, <laughs> or, or the few that don't know you? Sure. Uh, my name is David Picciuto, and I go by The Drunken Woodworker. I do uh, I do a couple of things. I do a weekly show where I highlight other mostly woodworkers, some metal workers, and some other makers, and just kind of show them off on, on my show. Uh, I, tr- I try to gather like – Maker news. I, I I never really enjoyed the the term maker. I, I but I can't. I don't know of a better way to expect uh, a better word to use. But so I just kind of like gather like cool things people have been making in, in the past week, and I show it all, show it off on my show, and I try to add a little bit of entertainment to that. Uh, besides that, I do uh, tutorials mostly on, uh, on like woodworking small crafts that you can then sell at craft fairs or on Etsy. And then I also do a weekly audio podcast called making it with Jimmy Daressa and Bob Claggett of, I like to make stuff. And that is how I spend my time. Well, it sounds like uh, pretty busy. Yeah. It's, it's, um, I wouldn't, con- it's 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 hard to describe it as work because it's always everything that I do is is fun. So it's busy, but I, busy in a in a really good way. You know, it's it's interesting that you say that. I feel the same way. If I'm having fun at it, I, I don't I don't care if I'm collecting uh, years towards a retirement or anything else. If I'm having fun, it's not work. It's just another day in paradise. Yep. yep. And exactly. I'm sure we've all experienced the uh, working for not fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure everybody has. So, All right. Well, um, let's go ahead and jump into what's going on in our shop right now. Uh, David, do you have any, any anything interesting going on in your shop? Well, uh, a couple days ago, I put out a video. It was my April Fool's video where I took – uh, what looked like a classic Mickey Mantle baseball card and like stupidly like spray mounted it to a piece of walnut and then put epoxy over top of that. And I didn't release it on April Fool's. I released it a couple days early to kind of throw people off. And uh, so I got some, I got a good reaction out of some baseball fans. Most I think most <laughs> people understood that it was an April Fool's joke, but I think uh, there was a there was a good handful of people that are like, "You are an idiot." And <laughs> I like that. I like I like to stir things up a little bit. Um, so, but besides that, uh, I am working on making it's a non woodworking project. I'm making a video on how to make a camera slider out of just materials that you can get from. Amazon and a couple other places and so I can mount my camera on this camera slider and then a motor moves it across uh, like a 
three and a half foot suction to get like these nice dolly shots in my in my shop because I, I I want to add like this artistic approach to some of my videos and if I'm gonna make something I might as well film it and put a video on it so that's what I'm working on and, and I'm ready to see that video um, just a few weeks ago maybe it's probably longer than that um, Garage Woodworks put out a video on how he made a manual camera slider mm -hmm. and I, I talked to him about it. I was like, man, that's awesome. How do you move it and still film? He's like, oh, well, I have my wife or kid or somebody else out in the <laughs> shop. Doing it. I was like, well, that's great. I, I usually don't have anybody out there that can help me. So it's like, well, that option's out for me. So hopefully your option's going to be more aligned where I can get some cool shots and yeah. uh, don't require my wife or my children out there because they – think i'm weird talking to a camera <laughs> like you i don't have anybody else to help me in the shop with that kind of stuff so it's going to come in real handy you can you can buy these things but they start at like eight hundred dollars and go way up from there and the parts that i for mine are around the two hundred dollar range so still kind of expensive to get all the parts that you need but way cheaper than if you're actually going to buy one so yeah, I've been experimenting with the the manual camera slider because I actually uh, was given one from uh, Lance Robleski from uh, Lance's Woodshop and Adventures. Uh, he kind of sold me a few tools, and he had a camera slider that he made with uh, just plywood and PVC pipe, a couple of uh, roller skate wheel kind of kind of things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was experimenting with how to make that thing work while I was out by myself and. I was, you know, doing the little manual push and letting it kind of go, and I'll go do something around, you know, the front side of the camera, and it would stop midway, and that that wasn't <laughs> gonna work. Yeah. So I started propping it up a little bit higher with some wood underneath it and kind of letting it go that way. But then you got to worry about catching it before it goes off the edge. <laughs> yes. So yeah, yeah. for a bad day, there goes the camera equipment <laughs> yeah. right onto the ground. A little yes. bad day. Yeah. So all right, Drew, uh, what's going on in your shop? Well, sadly, I'm still working on my my bench of joints. I, I plan on releasing that uh, this weekend, but life has kind of got in the way. So all of last week was pretty well shot, uh, and I wasn't able to get out in the shop hardly at all, except for to clean up some some minor mess. I did do a a little promo for Rockler on their new bandy clamps. Uh, they had sent me a set of four not too long ago, and was looking for some. YouTube uh, people to help promote it, and uh, since I was sponsored by them, they uh, threw some my way and asked me to put something together. Um, they plan on doing a big promo deal on the 7th with uh, the people that have participated. So I kind of had to throw that together fairly quickly, and uh, then I got started on my bench, uh, my little sitting bench last night. I got all the pieces cut and the joinery cut. So tonight I've got to paint it up and... Uh, I have to tape off all the joints so they don't get paint on them. That way I can glue it up nice and nice and tight. Uh, and then hopefully get my video edited and my plans. I think my plans are finished uh, for the most part. Um, I just got to do some minor work on them tonight. But other than that, that's that's all I've got. Um, like I, we discussed this so on the last show, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see exactly how all these joints are going to slide together and you're going to get <laughs> it to work. <laughs> well, I did do a dry fit last night to see how it was how it was going to do, and and everything's fitting together nice and and uh, and snug and kind of like a, a puzzle. It's, it's pretty cool, but awesome. because of all these joints, it's um, going to be nice and sturdy too. <laughs> nice. Well, that's good. Uh, my shop, I, I mean, I kind of I have a lot going on, but I'm not a lot actually getting finished. Um, in fact, though, uh, earlier this week I put out a video on turning a wine bottle stopper and this is a little different I when, I when I get out and turn something like that a pen or a bottle stopper um, even like salt and pepper shakers anything like that I I kinda have a, an idea of how I want to shape it but then halfway through it it generally looks like something else and I, and I decide to move in a different direction and that's kinda how this went you know it initially started out I was gonna do just a small little um, like cup sitting on top of it and the more I started shaping it the more it started taking the shape of uh, like a flower vase and so that's that's how I left it and then I wanted to finish it 
a little different than what I usually do. Um, you know, I usually I, I usually don't paint them, stain them, anything like that. I, I go with the natural finish of the wood. But I used a cheap piece of uh, pine two by two cut off, and I went to the kitchen and I got some of my wife's food coloring. It's just, I, she doesn't just have the little drops that come in the four pack for like a dollar. She has expensive stuff from Wilton and a little, and it's gel. So it, to me, it kind of resembles gel stain. And so I use some purple food coloring and and put that on the wood, and it really made the color pop exactly how I was wanting. I wouldn't want anything shiny. Um, it gave me a nice matte finish, and I, I think I sent De, uh, Drew a picture earlier in the week. I, my hands were covered, uh, just purple, and should have wore gloves. But uh, needless to say, the wife found out when she looked at my hands and wanted to know why they were purple. <laughs> and then I got chastised for it. But so next time I wear gloves, and maybe she won't know. Dude, I told you. Tell her it was made out of purple heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but she didn't see the project before she saw my hands. <laughs> I had to explain why my hands were purple, and it didn't help that my five-year-old's like, don't touch me, you're going to get me purple. <laughs> <laughs> so, five-year-olds, little boys, you ask him, he'll tell you he's a daddy's boy, but he sure tells on his dad a lot. So. <laughs> That's the fun part. Yeah. But other than that, you know, this week I'm trying to get the shop cleaned and uh, trying to trying to get other few projects wrapped up that I've been neglecting and sitting on. And in fact, I feel like I've driven more to the lumber yard and picked up lumber that's been on sale. Um, I get an email every week about different different species of lumber on sale. And last week or two weeks ago, it was some character cherry and character maple they had on sale for like two ninety nine a board foot. So I went and picked up like fifty board feet for like thirty bucks. And this this week I get a email saying they got uh gray gray elm on sale for three forty nine a board foot, which is about a six dollar savings. And I was like, uh I don't know how I'm gonna explain going to pick up another fifty board feet or whatever, but I'm I'm gonna head that way probably tomorrow. Um, and and you and you see women do this with clothes <laughs> yes guys are just the same it, it, but ours is i think ours is more practical <laughs> i mean cause it usually ends up with something that goes to her mother uh, my mother or her and in fact you know I'm, I'm trying to get my stock of items together so um i can enter into uh, this little like uh, farmers market craft fair that we that started oh about six months ago in the park right up the street from my house, and it doesn't help every time I make something and I, and I put it aside and I start making my pile. My wife's like, "Oh, I want that! I want that!" And I'm like, uh, "Sure, honey. I'm not going to tell you no, but I'm <laughs> never going to get a stockpile good enough to <laughs> to get entered into one of these things." Charger. There you go. That's what I was yeah. going to say. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure that's going to work. I, oh, I, live on the edge, man. <laughs> I mean, I, I could try. Here, here's your invoice. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> but I'll probably be sleeping on the couch. I'll bill you. And then all the other things, like all the time she's cooked, she's like, oh, that'll be five ninety five for that meal. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, can you go make me a drink? Oh yeah, that's two ninety nine. Oh. And no free refills. Exactly. I don't know. Two ninety nine is not bad for for a good drink. So. Yeah, but well, we only paid like ten dollars for the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say that it was going to be liquor. <laughs> it could have been water. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. No, she's. For some reason, I've gotten into this kick. I my my drink of choice is uh, Crown and Coke. For some reason, a, a friend of mine got me into Crown and Sprite. And then I got that green apple crown and mixed it with Sprite, and it's like drinking Kool-Aid. It goes <laughs> down way too fast. So that's 
she, she knows when she, when I ask her to go get a, a drink, that's that's what she goes get. So she'll she'll charge me premium for that because it's <laughs> something I want. So all right, well let's let's get into today's topics. Um, let's talk about hand tools. Do you guys use hand tools in your shop um, at all? Whether it be chisels, hand planes, saws, anything that's not ran by power. I a little bit. I personally, I have I have a set of decent chisels, and I don't use them that much. Just kind of clean up joinery. Um, I'm glad I have them because they they come in handy a lot of times for making making things fit the way they should. I also have a set of old crappy chisels that are great for re- removing glue that's dried up. Uh, and, and then you know I have. A few planes, but mostly I just use my little block planes to round over edges or to clean something up. Um, and I have a dovetail saw that I paid way too much for that I really don't use that much. Um, I don't, so I'm not, I wouldn't consider myself a hand tool user, but I have hand tools to make things fit better, if that makes sense. Yeah, it kind of. Yeah. Like Mark Spagnuolo's um, hybrid woodworking. Hi- hybrid woodworking, yeah, and you know they they, they complement each other. I see myself using a lot more hand tools as I get older and want to slow down. But right now, part of my job is making things and filming videos, and so to make it worth it, I have to work as fast as I can to get this, this video done and to be efficient with my time. And a lot of times hand tools doesn't fit into that routine. So, but as I get older and I want to just relax a little bit and enjoy the time in the shop a little bit more, I'll, I'll definitely see myself using hand tools a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I, I'm, I'm kind of that way myself as far as the, uh, uh, time constraint. I'm, and if you're making videos, you've got to get some things done and got to get them done in a pretty quick hurry. Uh, but if I'm not if I'm not filming, then I do take the time to break out a card scraper or a hand plane and and fine tune and, and just have nothing going on as far as power tools just to hear natural natural wood being carved out by a sharp blade. I mean it's mm-hmm. there's nothing like it sometimes. Right. Yeah, so I I'm gonna go out here and say I, I don't use hand tools very much i have um a set of chisels probably my my mother bought me my first set of chisels and i think she got them from harbor freight um long time ago and when my grandfather passed away i took most of his tools um and i got a few old chisels um craftsmen um, chisels and they're probably 20 years old if not a little older um, and I haven't used them that much um, but I would I use my chisels more than I do hand planes and the fact is I don't really understand the whole hand plane aspect of um, how far the blade should be protruding um, what, what's the proper gap between the blade and, and the mouth um, things like that and so I haven't bought any new hand planes i use um a couple that i got from my grandfather and they're by no means for any finesse work because the soles are i have some uh pitting and some rust and i just haven't found anybody that has had the time to help me restore them or give me a good direction on how to restore them um and in fact, two of the bench planes, I'm not even sure. I know they're Stanley, but I'm not sure what numbers they are. Um, and then I have a Stanley block plane from them. So I, I want to I want to get more into the bench planes and the hand planes because I think it would be good for flattening um, large surfaces. More specifically, I'm getting ready to build a workbench, um, and I think it would be awesome to help flatten that. Um, and I build primarily a lot of tables and I could use a belt sander. I could use a hand plane. I want to get into the way of using a hand plane, um, 
but it's really that's that's my learning curve is is hand planes once i can once i can hammer down um exactly what the proper um setup of them should be i think i'll be golden um so i want to get more into it i don't use a lot of it right now but i foresee myself just like you guys as i get older and I slow down, I'll be more more apt to use it. So I, per- I personally think there's just so much information out there when it comes to hand planes and you know how far the blade should how, how far the blade should be sticking out, the, 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 the gap between everything. There's just so much information that I think it does scare some people from actually wanting to do it. And there's just so many specialty planes now. And I think it really, you don't need a lot of that. You just need to get your hands on one and just start using it. And you'll, I, th- I think a lot of times you'll, you'll understand that, oh, yeah, well, this is, the blade's way too far down. We're, t- we're, take, we're taking on huge chunks or whatever, or we're not removing enough material. And a lot of times you can, you can just learn on the fly, and you just have to block all that information overload that we're constantly receiving. Yeah, I agree. Um, and it's it's kind of like all these YouTube channels. I mean, everybody has a different way of doing something. It doesn't mean that uh, one way is is wrong from another or or drastically different. Um, it's just everybody kind of develops their own uh, their own personal style on how not only to use but to teach. Mm-hmm. On how to use them. Yep. It, uh, you know, I I take that back. I do have one other plane. Um, for Christmas, I got the Lee Valley and Veritas uh, miniature router plane. Uh, I haven't used it yet. I haven't had a project in need for it. But I I just remember that I did get that, and in fact, it's sitting out on the workbench, taunting me every time I'm out there. <laughs> so I had that I had that small one, and I've used it uh, a few times to just clean up some some dados cut with the table saw or um, uh, um, just some some gaps in some box joints that I was making. So that little thing came in handy a couple times. Do you use any kind of uh, card scrapers or cabinet scrapers? I have both. Um, I have the card scrapers and I I should use them more just to save on on sanding. Uh, the the cabinet scraper is awesome, and I, actually I should use that more too. And and that I think that was the the reason I got the cabinet scraper is so I could do less sanding. But for whatever reason, I when I get to that part of the project, I just go right for my my palm sander, and uh, I th- I think I'm. I have the, I have my own mental blocks where I'm like uh, I don't want to screw this up or there's too many curves there's not enough flat areas on this for me to use this so I'm just gonna go to the palm sander and take the easy route but I know down the road my lungs are gonna like the cabinet scrapers and and the card scrapers better because they don't make all the fine dust. Yeah, so I, I have a Stanley number eighty, um, and again, in fact, it's, I. Some guy was selling it on on a Facebook group that um, I'm in, and man, he sold it for like twenty bucks. I think I paid twenty five to have to buy it and have it shipped to me. And I just again time. I haven't had the time to flatten the sole properly, and I'm gonna buy a new blade for. It. I'm gonna buy a, buy a hawk blade for it, mm-hmm. um, and and hopefully you know. I, in fact, I that that's my that's my April goal. By the end of April, I'm gonna have that up and running. That's a good goal. That that way, I can uh, use it to help level some joints on on sofa table that has been in my shop now for about seven months. <laughs> I'm curious <laughs> to know if Drew, do you use a cabinet scrapers or card scrapers at all? Uh, yeah, I, I haven't done it on camera yet, sadly. Um, but I do have you know like the gooseneck and the concave, as well as the just the the plain flat card scrapers. Um, I don't have a, uh, one of those little fancy holders that you put them in just to save your, your, the burning on, on your fingers. But, uh, 
I do have uh, several types of ways to, to sharpen them, um, but for the most part, uh, I I tend to use the sander, and I'm kind of like you. It's it's a <laughs> a time. It, it just seems like it saves time in your head just yeah. to grab your your palm sander. But sometimes you screw up your project with your sander more than you would your scraper. <laughs> Probably right. Yeah. But yeah, I uh, I enjoy using them. It's it's very relaxing just to turn everything off and uh, just go to town with it. Yep. Did you know, Drew, that if you put a uh, refrigerator magnet on the back of your card scraper, that it will eliminate the the heat? The heat buildup. Yeah. No, I didn't I mean, know that. It's still going to have a heat buildup, but it's going to be just like what the little fancy holders do. They're going to um, block the heat. Hang on, I'll be right back with you guys. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I think I've seen Matt Vandalist use the uh, refrigerator magnet trick. I don't know if that's his trick or if that's just a common common trick, but I've, I've seen him use that before. Yeah, um, I, I I haven't had a lot of experience with the scrapers. I, I originally started using them um, way before I even thought about YouTube. Uh, I think it was around the time when I was doing craft shows. And uh, I was using them to uh, flatten out like uh, box joints and, and dovetail joints, which is kind of hard on the scraper is uh, hitting it with ingrain. <laughs> right. But uh, if they were fairly close uh, after I've sanded it, uh, then I would just really fine tune it with the scraper. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's it's just a, a really, really smooth finish. In, instead of flattening the grain out, you're actually just shearing it off and it's, uh, it's just a beautiful finish, and it does save on a lot of sanding. I I wish I would use it more, especially in my videos. Uh, people have commented a couple of times that they rarely see me use any any hand tools whatsoever. <laughs> um, I, I tend to use chisels when I can, if I ever have the need to, uh, just to mainly flatten out a, a, a dado or something if it's not quite not quite flat. Mm-hmm. I originally uh, used router planes. I don't know if you ever. Ha- bought a router plane, yeah. But I've got a number yeah. seventy one Stanley, and it's uh, it's a really good plane. I I enjoy it. Yeah, I um I think early on, and when it was a hobby, I got caught up in the oh hand tools look so cool and and look at this person use this and everybody talks about this company so I'm, I'm going to get me a couple couple of these things and it's going to change everything and it didn't they just became little trophies that sit on the shelf in my workbench you know exactly <laughs> I'm proud to have paper. them <laughs> yeah <laughs> but um, I, yeah oh, go ahead go ahead I didn't mean to interrupt I, you. I just keep telling I was just going to say I I just keep telling myself that someday I'm going to use them a lot more and I'm going to get my money's worth out of them so well, uh, since Jeremy kind of had to step away for obvious reasons, uh, <laughs> one of the things that we wanted to find out uh, that people that are getting into hand tool work is uh, one of the big problems that people have is how to sharpen them. Uh, I, I know whenever I was growing up, um, this is kind of off the subject from hand tools, but my brother was really good at sharpening pocket knives, and he could sharpen them so well that it could shave hair off your arm. Mm-hmm. Um, but I never had that talent. I would I would pretty much dull my blade worse. <laughs> uh, so sharpening is is something that is uh, kind of eluded me. So I've always had to buy aids to uh, assist in in sharpening. And in my case, uh, for like my uh, chisels and uh, planer planer knives or planer blades rather, I would uh, I had to buy a uh, honing guide. <laughs> Just to be able to run it over the stone and, and create a nice uh, sharpened edge, because there's no way that I could do it by hand consistently mm-hmm. without uh, probably concaving or convexing the plate. Uh, <laughs> All right, guys, I'm I'm back. That's that single parent thing on an infant. <laughs> While you're gone, we wrapped up the show. Yeah. <laughs> oh well, well, that makes my job easy. Yeah. Wait, no, because then I got to edit it all. <laughs> Good luck. Oh, for some reason it just stopped recording. Sorry. <laughs> all right, so uh, have you guys started talking about sharpening methods at all? Yep, yeah, we just uh, started touching on that. I was actually going to uh, ask David what's uh, 
his pre- preferred method that he has. Well, uh, it's funny that t- you said today's episode is sponsored by WorkSharp, and that is my preferred mesh. My preferred method is the WorkSharp 3000, I believe it is. Uh, before I had that, I was using the Whetstones, and I did not have a dedicated sharpening station. So whenever it was time to sharpen something, I'd just be like, nah, I don't want to. It's messy. I have to get everything out, and then I have to clean everything up. And since I got that WorkSharp 3000, that's kind of changed everything. Like, it just takes all the guesswork out of it, makes it really quick. There's a dedicated station where the machine sits, and I just I just use that now. So, um, Go ahead, Jeremy. I've already, I've already talked a little bit. You can have, have this. All right. So my go-to method um, has always been traditional stones. Um, wet stones, and I have a DMT, uh, I think it's called Duo Sharp. It's got one grid on one side, another grid on the other. Um, I have the low low grid on that that I use to flatten stones. And I have some, uh, I think they're the Shapt- Shapton stones. And that's been my go-to method, um, which can be very time consuming Um, especially I'm exactly like David I don't have a spot set up um, dedicated to sharpening so I got to get them out I got to get water I got to spray them down sharpen and then I clean them off so my quick just need to bring a an edge right back to sharp takes you know a good 10 minutes Um, you know it takes 60 seconds once the stones are set up but until the stones are set up, it, it you know it takes about ten minutes, um, and until I I just got a work sharp three thousand into the shop um, last week or the week before, and the first thing I did I went for my oldest chisel from my grandfather, and I think it's a little uh, three H chisel maybe maybe a quarter, um, just beat up. He used it to clean up his glue lines. I took that chisel, took it right to the WorkSharp 3000, and man, did it just bring it down and, and mirror it up. It, it It is sharp. I don't know if my grandfather ever saw it that sharp. <laughs> so, and, and it did it quick. Just like you said, the, the WorkSharp 3000 was it, so quick, and it it almost took, like, no guesswork out of it. I mean, you don't. You know, I have a Veritas MK2, I think it's what it's called, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, honing guide. Yeah, the yeah. honing guide. There you go. And it, it's got a lot of bells and whistles on it and it, it, it's, it, it can be quite, quite tedious to get it set up exactly to the angle you want it. But the WorkSharp 3000, I mean, it, you put it up there and, you know, you, you flip down the, the little, deal in the front for an extra five degrees um you know it it made it easy for me and so i think that will probably become my go-to system for sharpening um just for the fact that i don't necessarily need a dedicated sharpening area as far as i can just set it off over on the workbench um in in the corner and leave it plugged in and i can go over there and i don't need a, a big area to do it in you know, I put a little light beside it so I can see what I'm doing. But, you know, I, and, and I got the leather strop for for it. Um, and, man, that just, it, it brings a, brings the edge back quickly. And, you know, you're back to work in just, just a few seconds. Yeah. I, I would imagine the hand tool enthusiast would not like the idea of a work sharp in their, in their, system but as a guy who mostly uses power tools and hand tools once in a while it really just it makes everything so much easier just and then it only takes it only takes a minute or two to stop what i'm doing sharpen and go right back to what i'm doing a lot of times if i get distracted if i had to go back to the whetstones i would like i'd get everything out i'd sharpen and then I have to wash my hands. I'm like, oh, while I'm washing my hands, I might as well go get a soda. And oh, what's I might as well check my email. And it would like ruin my whole flow just to go to do the traditional sharpening method. But the the work sharp really 
changed all that. At least you you get halfway through that method. I, <laughs> I so I don't have a I don't have a sink in my shop, which that's I want a just a just like a utility sink in the shop for that reason. I don't I have to go into the house and into the kitchen to get the water. Well, I'm already in there. I'm like, ah, I'm kind of hungry, so let's let's get a sandwich. <laughs> Oh, well, I'm gonna go check on my wife if she's home or the kids or, and then, then that's the mistake because my wife wants to talk to me about everything, and by that time I'm like, ah, you know what? I'll go back out to the shop tomorrow. <laughs> so, anything that can keep me in the shop, out of the house, is gonna make my work go by a lot faster. Um, so, like I said, I you know I've always wanted a Tormek system. Um, but the price range on a Tormek was around eight hundred dollars, and that doesn't include a lot of the other jigs that come with it. I saw myself I could buy the Festool Domino um, or a new joiner, a uh, new planer, any, any of those combination of things. Um, and I think the Worksharp does about ninety five percent of, if not as much as the Tormek system. And it comes in, I think, right around like three hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, so to me, I mean, it was just—it's a no-brainer. Um, go for something that does the, the comparable job um, for cheaper. Yeah, especially if you're looking to get started in that kind of a, a system, or or even just using hand tools uh, to integrate into your woodworking. Because, like you've all said, anything that you can do to help save you time. As well as the headache of not being able to sharpen manually, like I was never given that <laughs> that talent. Like I said, um, yeah, it, it will be a great benefit to the to the shop. And, and like you, Jeremy, I I recently uh, got the Worksharp three thousand as well. Um, I haven't been able to experiment with it yet because last week my you know, the, all of that was shot. So <laughs> I am very very anxious to not only use it but to uh, make a uh, kind of like a dedicated station for it uh, something similar to what Stumpy Nubs put out I th- he had a, uh, a Worksharp 3000 that he made a, a dedicated uh, holder and, and <clears throat> storage case for so I'm, I'm uh, probably going to take some ideas off of that and uh, really deck it out kind of like I did my Craig jig <laughs> yeah and you know I I, I don't seek out sponsors for the show um, unless I really believe in their product, and and that's a, and I do the exact same thing on on my channel. Um, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put it out there that I use it. I believe in it if I don't actually like it. And so I got I I tried their knife sharpening the work sharps knife sharpening um, system at Christmas. My brother got it, and um. Man, it brought some ten-year-old kitchen knives back in thirty seconds, and so I really started. I, you know, I, I kind of I didn't know they had a woodworking machine. I, I kind of knew it in the back of my mind, but I was like, ah, let me check. And I, uh, sure enough, man, they, I got it, and it, it's just as easy to work as their little knife jig. Hmm. Um, you know, and so I. Uh, and the fact that the companies have already started making accessories for it. I was at Rockler the other day, and DMT now makes a a diamond stone for like a diamond wheel for the work chart. Um, so if you find that the sandpaper doesn't necessarily work out to how you want it, or it's not aggressive enough, you need to you need um, a diamond stone to to really help you out. DMT makes those. Um, Right now, I don't have a need for it. I haven't recognized the need for it. Uh, the sandpaper that, that comes with the system works wonderfully, but the fact that people are already starting to identify the system and <clears throat> and create accessories for it makes it uh, worth worth my while. Hmm. I, I, I didn't know that the Diamond Stones existed for, for the machine, and I, I, that's interesting because the sandpaper is definitely going to wear out or it's going to clog up. And the diamond stones you can clean and they're they're good for many, 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 many years. So, 
<laughs> yeah. That's good to know. I, yeah, I didn't know it either, and I was just happened to be um, at Rockler, and, and, I, and I looked at their sharpening uh, area in the store, and you know, I saw the work Sharp 2000, which was the system previous to the 3000. Um, and I was just kind of looking around and, and I saw a DMT and it was a circle. So I kind of picked it up and, uh, and it said that it works for the workshop 2000 and 3000 system. Hmm. Um, I don't know how many different grits they have. Um, Rockler only had one grit and I can't remember what it was, but you know, I, I, I know they're at least starting to make, um, a product for it. So. Well, that'll cool. It'll, it'll be uh, a lot of assets that'll be coming up in the near future to have for uh, for a sharpening system such as that that can take it from the original level when it was produced to way beyond what you anticipated. Yeah, and, and if you don't if you don't think you have a need for such an aggressive system because you don't have old chisels or whatever it is, in, in my opinion, every single hand tool that comes from the manufacturer doesn't come as sharp as it can be. Every, I, I think every single blade, whether it be Hawk, uh, Lee Nielsen, Lee Valley Veritas, whatever it be, will always need some work when it when you receive it. Um, whether it be a quick leather um, strop, um, but th- this system will definitely help speed up that process. And it'll make that brand new plane that you just spent several hundred dollars on um, make you feel like that was worth your investment. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Well, um, if y'all would like to have a Workshop 3000 for yourself, good news is you can head over to uh, countrysideworkshop.com slash giveaway and you can enter to win a WorkSharp 3000. The giveaway runs through May 1st. Um, it'll end um, midnight May 1st when we will pick a random winner, and then WorkSharp will send it straight to you. Um, so if you're interested in, in winning one, head over there, enter, um, and if you just can't wait to find out if you win one, uh, remember they gave a discount code, that you can go to their website and you can use it to purchase anything, um, any of their sandpaper, uh, WorkSharp 3000, their knife jigs, whatever it be, you can head over there and use that. So I, I did want to bring one more announcement to the show, um, and it's something that Drew and I talked about. Um, we're going to be switching the day that the show is actually released. Um, we're still going to shoot to record every other Thursday night. Um, but we're going to start releasing on Monday. So the show should be in your um, RSS account, iTunes, wherever you listen to the show. It should be ready for you to listen Monday morning. Um, and that, that several things led to that decision. Um, for one, that there's starting to be um, some great audio podcasts out about woodworking um, with making it um, – our podcast, and then you have Wood Talk um, that come out um, generally on a, a weekly or every uh, other week basis. We don't want to all release on the same day. We want to spread that out. So I'm gonna we're gonna start releasing on Monday. That way, Monday morning you have something to listen to. Tuesday morning with Wood Talk, you have something to listen to. Then Making It comes, and then Wood Talk comes again. So that way you have something to listen to every day. Um, and it also gives us the opportunity to adjust our schedule if need be. So if we can't record Thursday night and get the show out Friday morning, you're not looking for that on Friday morning. It gives us a few days to adjust the schedule um, on the recording uh, aspect as need be. That way we can still give you a show on Monday every time we record. So, you have anything to say about that, Drew? No, I completely agree with the uh, with the time frames. It's it's just like releasing the YouTube videos. It's it's going to give people something that uh, they they can casually listen to on their way to work. And that's another thing that we're trying to do is to keep our our shows to a, a shorter time frame. Uh, we were experimenting with doing it for a, an hour, um, but 
that kind of limits our audience, especially since not everybody's commute to work is a is an hour there and back even. Um, and so we're trying to make them a little bit shorter, a little more enjoyable, faster pace, uh, and and just getting through the subject matters uh, without much much uh, diverting from the subject matter as it is. Uh, so having these little changes, uh, it, it's going to make this show a little bit more enjoyable for everybody. Exactly. Um, David, just a few weeks ago, I believe, uh, Making It went to a weekly show, correct? That is correct, yep. We release on Fridays. Okay, there you go. That's what I was going to get to if y'all had a set day that you release. So basically, tomorrow morning when people wake up, or at some point tomorrow, we should have a Making It episode. That is correct. And funny thing is, we do talk a little bit about sharpening. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's, not the, it's not the focus of the episode, but uh, we, sharpening does make its way into the, ep- into the show. So it's a fun one, too. This one, uh, we, we talk about what tools we would want if we were stranded on an island. <laughs> and, and, it, and it goes into some strange directions. It was one of the more fun ones to record. I, I, can, I can see that, especially um, with Jimmy. He probably has some, some unique aspect on that. That dude can make a tool out of anything, though. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't, yeah, he wouldn't even need to take anything to the island. He would just turn sand into something and make tools from that. Yeah. All right, David, well, um, you told us about making it. Uh, you kind of want to tell us how everybody else can get in touch with you, um, where they can find you, um, if they're interested in hearing more about you um, or watching your videos. Sure. Uh, you can find everything at drunkenwoodworker.com, and that has links to all my social medias, my YouTube videos and Instagram and Twitters and Facebooks. I'm pretty active on all that. Um, while we're on the subject of WorkSharp, I am not sponsored by WorkSharp whatsoever, but I did put out a WorkSharp unboxing and first use video back on February 9th, so you'll find that on my blog. And it's just... Uh, a coincidence that I recently got one, not sponsored by it, and then here I am on the show, and I actually do do like my machine a lot. So, drunkenwoodworker.com. All right. Well, we'll, we'll get the link to your video, and we'll put it down in the show notes. Um, so if you want to see that video, either head over to Drunken Woodworker or check out the show notes, and we'll have links. I will also be putting out a video, hopefully – this week, if not next week, about the work sharp. Um, and it's actually going to be, you're actually going to see that that 20-year-old chisel um, having a new lease on life. <laughs> so, well, David, I want to uh, thank you for coming on to the show and, and being our co-host and telling us a little bit about yourself. Thanks for having me. It was fun. All right, yeah. Drew, you want to... You want to yep. give the contact info and then we'll get will, out of here? I will take it from here. Uh, let's see. Uh, remember, folks, the, the, the show that you're listening to, uh, we, we are able to do it because of people like you, the people that listen to the show, the people that share the, uh, the content, make comments. Um, and the, the people that we would like to give thanks to uh, this week is uh, – Tamesh or Tamish, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Uh, you actually commented on episode four last, uh, well, two weeks ago, saying that you're enjoying the show and uh, both of our channels, respectively, uh, as well, and we greatly appreciate that. And also, Paul Mayette, he is a loyal listener since we started, and he is uh, greatly enjoying the show as well. So, guys, uh, we, we want to thank you very much for, for commenting and sharing and getting our show to the uh, public eye. Uh, As always, Jeremy and I would like to thank you for listening to this show, and we had a great time. We hope you can uh, join us again. Um, Woodshop 101 is basically a show that brings the basics of woodworking and more to you uh, with special guests as well. And we would like to give a special thanks to our guest this week, David Picciuto, the Drunken Woodworker. Please go and check out his channel for any more details that you want on his show. Uh, You will find links in the description uh, as well as the show notes. Uh, remember, if you like the show and you want to hear more, you can find us on iTunes or YouTube by searching Woodshop 101 Podcast. Be sure and hit that subscribe button because the more subscribers that we have, the more availability we have, the more people we reach, 
and the better opportunity that we will have for sponsorships in the future. So be sure and subscribe and enjoy the show every time we make a post, you'll be notified. And if you don't have iTunes, that's not a problem. Just go to uh, www.woodshop101podcast.com slash listen. There you'll find links for streaming each episode through your smartphone, tablet, or computer. Also, if you have any questions that you want to shoot our way, you can email us at woodshop101podcast at gmail.com or you can leave, a, leave us a voicemail on Skype. Just search woodshop 101 uh, podcast, and then just leave a leave us a voicemail message there. Um, we'll answer your questions, or we'll even feature the answer on the show uh, with your question, of course. Uh, so uh, that'll be a cool way to kind of interact with the audience. Uh, also, you can find us on Twitter at Woodshop One Hundred One Pod and Facebook Woodshop One Hundred One Podcast. Uh, we post new episodes every two weeks, so we hope to hear from you very soon. And from Jeremy, myself, and of course David Picciuto, we wish you well, and please remember to be safe in your shops. So we'll see you next time. And David, thank you again for joining us. Thank you. It was fun. Bye. Bye. Good night. <laughs>